So some of this is going to be redundant with, with what we heard earlier. Um, I'll try to go through that as quickly as possible. Um, and I'm not sure why this thing won't work now. It's the middle button. That's why. Thank you. So British Columbia, you know, identified by this polygon here, um, the reintroduction site uh, right here, Chekhovset Bay um, area. And I think that Linda included a little bit of the San Juan Islands up in here. Another attempt to um, extract some historic sites from the U.S. <clears throat> so dates relevant to, to sea otters in British Columbia. Um, I guess extirpated as a species in, in 19, er, 1930 and reintroduced 1969 to 1972. Again, I think three reintroductions. It, again, might, might be important uh, in considering future introductions of the species. Bounding population size of about 28 animals. So this is one example uh, where they have fairly good numbers fairly good indication, an estimate of what the loss was. San Nicolas Island, I think we had a 90% 90, 90 loss of, of the, the animals that were translocated here. Uh, maybe a third of, um, two thirds of, of the animals lost. And that might be about the range that you might expect. You can expect to have a fairly high loss of, of animals. Um, population continues to increase both in numbers and in range, demonstrated here by the, by the blue shading along Vancouver Island and uh, the, the, the central BC coast uh, identified by this Goose Island group. See, I think we didn't talk about the conservation status, um, but it was a, originally classified as endangered by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, it's CAUSE, is it? an acronym I never grasped. But um, eventually, over time, as the population increased, range expanded, they've, they've slowly been downlisting, if you will, uh, the status of, of, of sea otters in British Columbia from threatened um, to most recently to a species of special concern under their Species uh, species at Risk Act. And they're currently protected from harm and disturbance under this Marine Mammal Regulations of the Canadian Fisheries Act that um, I was referred to earlier as well. Uh, so this is a brief history of the population survey efforts in, in British Columbia. And these, they actually took place or began in 1977, and they've, they occurred at about one to three year intervals. Um, until 1988, the surveys were conducted from fixed wing aircraft. Um, and since that time, they've been conducted by standardized methods using small boats. And I think this is an important point um, because as you get sea otters reintroduced into a Oregon, one of the things that you're going to need to consider is how you're going to monitor the status of the population. And there's a variety of different ways to survey sea otters, um, and, but they need to be considered kind of in the, in the context of the types of habitat and the range that sea otters occur in initially, but also consider about where they might expand into um, and how survey design might be continued or adapted over time. Let's see, the entire uh, BC coast is surveyed at approximately a five-year interval um, with the core of the population around the translocation site surveyed annually since 1988 with additional portions of the range selected for annual surveys. So here's uh, basically two, two plots of, of growth in Seattle populations. Notice this is a log scale. Um, on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And again, earlier in the recovery period, the growth rate in British Columbia was approaching 20%. It's now moderated. Um, and the average annual, when you consider the population as a whole, 
uh, the growth rate is about 7% in this population. And we're going to look at some data on, again, some of the variation in growth rates over different spatial scales. Uh, today, well, in 2013, about 5,600 sea otters on the Vancouver Island portion of British Columbia. Central mainland coast, um, about 1,100 sea otters in 2013 uh, with annual growth rates um, averaged at about 12.5% per year. This is the current or the occupied range of sea otters um, in 2013 uh, with, again, th those two different um, distinct kind of populations, the, the Vancouver Island coast and the, the mainland BC coast. Um, and this was the range expansion by 2013. They're essentially kind of expanding from the Vancouver coast over to the, to the mainland coast. And while this map suggests a fairly even distribution, when you plot a, a density distribution, um, you can see that, that there's areas of high density, again, particularly where they, they were reintroduced initially, and, and it's some, some other areas. But there are other areas where the densities are fairly low. <laughs> and this patchy distribution results, again, from, from a variety of different factors. One of them being those small home ranges uh, that I talked about earlier. There's a very strong social component to, to sea otters that's, that I think is really important in considering um, how they might adapt or, or respond to, to translocations. They have a very strong siphon. So I mentioned a strong, a small home range. But not only is their home range small, <laughs> But, but who they associate with on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis is important. And it's the same animals. So if I live um, in, in Newport, Oregon, I, I am going to associate with a very re relatively small number of animals on a, on a daily basis. Um, we see we, through tagging programs, we've seen that animals uh, will kind of associate with in the same resting groups with, with the same animals over, over their lifetimes, essentially, in the same kelp beds. Um, so it's an aspect that we know relatively little about, kind of how they, you know, their complexities of their social structure, but it's very clear that they associate with the same individuals as a result of these small home ranges and in preferred resting habitats, if you will. Um, and some of the distribution patterns are respond or reflect specifics of the distribution of habitat. So they often rest in those same areas that provide um, some kind of refuge from kind of adverse environmental conditions of a variety of different types. So in this plot, there's you can see uh, different colored segments of the coastline, and those represent areas that are newly occupied in the, in the northern part and in the southern part. And what we see here are growth rates of about 20% of per year uh, from 2009 to 2013. But when we look at the, the long occupied areas, uh, kind of in the central portion of the range, those great growth rates are at 2 to 5% per year. Again, reflecting kind of this, um, this structuring of sea otter populations at at relatively small spatial scales. And we see the same thing on the central BC coast. Um, the, well, growth rates that are kind of at the maximum potential for the species um, at the periphery of the range and those long occupied range or long occupied areas, uh, growth rates that are quite modest. See, there was a, a 2017 survey uh, conducted of the entire BC coast, the entire range of, of sea otters. And I don't have any data from those. <laughs> but, but here, this is an interesting plot. It shows the uh, recognized range here and, and up in here, but also the, let me see, the extra limital sightings, if you will, and, and where those are occurring. Uh, in the Straits of Georgia, um, in Queen Charlotte Sound, and, and Haida Gwaii. So with suggesting anyway that 
expansion, it will continue to occur throughout the, the BC coastline. Um, I asked Linda for this to be consistent with, with what I was talking about for Southeast Alaska. And, uh, and essentially, that there were no adverse effects of sea otter recolonization, at least through 1997, uh, from the introduction of sea otters to commercial fisheries. Um, there, apparently, there, there are some, some impacts, I think, um, at, at more local levels and um, probably relegated to cultural uses by, by indigenous folks. Um, they have seen significant declines in the density of, of red urchins and um, an increase in the in the kelps. We, we saw some of that data earlier, uh, but but there hasn't been on these same some of these same species that we saw some declines in Ala in southeast Alaska are not yet evident in, in British Columbia, and that was the cucumber and the gooey duck fishery. Um, and to date, I guess there hasn't been a an effect on the crab fisheries on these crab commercial crab fisheries. Um, and so, and we have now it's kind of a, the alternative of documented or suspected positive impacts. And and again, um, this, this increase in primary productivity in this system that, that seems to be evident across the range of the species and the range of habitats that they occur in. Uh, Increases in, uh, let's see, the trophic levels that rockfish are feeding at, having to do with uh, again these, this um, the greater availability of kelp and the habitat of that for for rockfish species, uh, the increased carbon sequestration we heard about, um, and and again an increasing interest in ecotourism in British Columbia. Linda and I thank you for that. Thank you.